Our study tonight is Leviticus chapter 12 and 13, and I trust that you have read ahead, and I admire you being here all the more. A couple of things to think about throughout our Bible study tonight is, first, it, it will seem like I'm talking way too much in the first part of this Bible study to get all the way through both chapters. We are getting through both chapters tonight. Uh, we will be able to pretty much race through chapter 13 and 14 in our study next week, uh, but uh, tonight we will get that. Secondly, um, think about Jesus. Now, that's something you'd expect me to say, but think about Jesus. And maybe that moment when he walked up to those ten lepers and healed them when nobody else ever did. And Jesus is the only person ever to, with a touch, heal the disease of leprosy. The only one ever, the only one who ever offered the hope of healing to Jews. It was just Jesus. Father, as we begin tonight, Lord, we meet you in a passage of Scripture that uh, is difficult. Uh, it's difficult to digest. It's difficult to understand. But Holy Spirit, you're here tonight. And I ask that you would minister to each and every one of us here. I too pray, though it's unlikely, Lord, that if there's anyone here on a Wednesday night Leviticus Bible study who's unsaved, Lord, you know it was your divine design to get him here. So knock on the door of his heart or her heart and ask them to be yours. For the rest of us, Lord, help us to fall more in love with you and your graciousness toward those of us who are lepers. Lord, let us leave here more grateful and hopefully not grossed out. We thank you, Lord, for entrusting the book of Leviticus to us. May we bring you honor and glory. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've had a bunch of random thoughts going through my mind as Paul has been reading this. Uh, believe it or not, one of the first things that I would think about was my favorite character on television of all time, Adrian Monk. There's no way that Mr. Monk could have been a priest. Because the things that you're going to see that Aaron and his sons are tasked to do are just things that he wouldn't be able possibly to understand at all. He just couldn't fathom them. The gag reflex just wouldn't have done it. The second thing to think about is how this applies to you. It's easy to read this and just get through it. But, but I'm absolutely certain the Holy Spirit wants to say something to each and every one of you. He wants to meet you here with our own leprosy. The third thing that's been running through my mind is praying for Dr. Peter, Dr. Sheba, and the staff at Malta Medical. You know, something we don't think about. You know, healing ministries are so often misrepresenting the Lord that we think it's a glamorous thing. Here's the deal. If you have a healing ministry, you're going to be around a lot of sick people. And certainly Aaron and his sons were around a lot of sick, gross, and disgusting things. I would hope that all of you are praying for the staff at Malta Medical daily. I pray every day for them, every day that Malta Medical is open. I pray that the Lord would protect them from the illnesses that walk into that place, and they are many. But not only protect them, but then I pray, Lord, use their touch to win the hearts of other people. And certainly that's what God was trying to communicate here. The high priest, the man who went into the Holy of Holies, when they brought those sores to him, he had to touch him and scratch him in some cases, smell them. He needed to be prayed for. But you see, it's a touch of Jesus. 
that is the answer to all of the things that we're going to talk about this week and next week. Chapter 12, it's a quick one. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Now, I, I want to emphasize at the beginning that there's no moral uncleanness in having a baby. Certainly, ladies, have your monthly cycle. There's no moral uncleanness implied here at all. But we're talking about ritual or ceremonial uncleanness. And the ritual was important because it pointed to Jesus Christ. And we know that blood is really important in the plan of God. Now, circumcision, as you are aware, was a covenant agreement that God made with Abraham, a sign that Jewish men belonged to God. Now, only God knew. Nobody could certainly see their private parts. But it was an idea that this is what identifies you. Now, ladies, you just came back from a Sweet Summer Devotion series, The God Who Sees Me. Well, in the same way that God understood which males were and were not circumcised, God sees your hearts. And in this particular case, this was a religious ritual of circumcision. Circumcision was not normal in the ancient world. In some cases, it was considered barbaric. In fact, only in Egypt, which I think is interesting, only in Egypt did they practice circumcision until Israel, with the covenant of circumcision, came along. And it was done on the eighth day. That's significant for you and for me because eight is the number of new beginnings. It was the day when Jesus himself was circumcised. And by the way, medically speaking, it's the perfect day because at that time, eighth day, the vitamin K in a baby's body is sufficient to stop the bleeding and help the healing process of circumcision. Now, they don't wait eight days any longer. They just give them a shot of vitamin K. But the idea is God knew what he was doing all along. Now, keep in mind that circumcision is a painful cutting away of the flesh. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul speaks about you and me being circumcised in the heart. And as I said a moment ago, only God can see that sign because he knows everything about us. Verse 4 says this. <clears throat> then the woman, <clears throat> excuse me, then the woman must wait 33 days, that's 40 days total, to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. Now, with both the boy child and the girl child, the idea here is the sort of a, a, a ancient version of our modern-day maternity leave. This was God just giving the woman a chance to be alone with a child, to nurse, to bond with her child. It's more important than we give it credit for. You know, women who have a baby and get right back to work, um, they're missing something. The baby needs to bond <clears throat> with his mother and the mother with the child. And this is sort of the ancient version of that. God understood that need for bonding and for physical recovery. <clears throat> Verse 5, if she gives birth to a daughter for two weeks, the woman will be unclean as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days, now we're at 80 days total, to be purified from her bleeding. I recently had a call from an angry, angry woman on the radio program about this issue, and her point was simple. She said, this passage proves that God favors men over women. The God is anti-women, he wants to keep us down. And I said, how does that prove it? Well, well, the time for purification, if they have a girl child, is double that of a boy child. And I think that points out that God is unfair. Now, let me say a couple of things. First, be always be very, very careful when you accuse God of being unfair. I mean, that's a really, really big charge to make against a God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Now, there is an obvious reason for this. The reason that a boy only required eight, uh, seven days and then on the eighth day be circumcised is because the baby and the mother had to be out 
to bring the child for circumcision. Jesus himself was circumcised on the eighth day. And of course, if they're going to be on the eighth day, then the process had to be over. With a girl child, it just gave the mother that much more time, sweeter time. It's just God saying, this is so important. Get to know your baby. Let your baby get to know you. A time in the ancient world, it was very, very tough. Women were expected to work, and often they had to get right back out into providing for the family. And God is saying, just slow down, take it easy, and bond with your child and enjoy the time. There's plenty of time later for work. So that's all this is, is God providing maternity leave for the people. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she's to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her. And then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. Again, I want to emphasize this doesn't mean that there's anything about bearing a child that is sinful or unclean. This is only a ritual or ceremonial uncleaning. Now, the idea here, and this is why the ritual was necessary, God was giving us a picture of Sarah of, of original sin. We're born sinners. That always gets people upset with me when I say this. But your precious little children are sinners. Jesus said in his conversation with Nicodemus that we are born condemned already. David said in his prayer of repentance, surely I was steeped in sin at birth. That's who they are. Now, if you've had children, you know, no matter how smitten you were with your child, no matter how wonderful it was, it took you about five minutes when you got them home to realize they were sinners. And that's just the way it is. We were born into sin, and the doctrine of original sin is simply that we inherit the sin nature from Adam, and because we have a sin nature, we sin. And if original sin is not a problem, then Jesus didn't have to die. If original sin is not a problem, then God's response to all of you who sin would be that, oh, you can beat this. The problem is that we can't beat it. It's who we are. The Apostle Paul said, in my flesh is no good thing. Jesus himself said to the rich young ruler, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. And the rich young ruler thought he was pretty hot stuff. But this is a doctrine of original sin. How long does it take to realize your babies are sinners? Not long at all once you get home. This is why Jesus said being born once isn't good enough. That's why he said we must be born twice or we must be born again. He told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It was Jesus who set that premise before him. So if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. You know what's fascinating to me about this is that Jesus' stepfather and his mother Mary offered two turtle doves as their sacrifice when he was consecrated to the Lord. That's when they ran into Simeon and Anna. That's when Simeon said, now I can rest in peace. My soul has seen the consolation of Israel. Jesus was poor. His family offered the cheapest offering they possibly could. The Son of God, who is God the Son, who left the riches of heaven for you and for me, he left it all behind. Not only did he empty himself of his deity, he emptied himself of any semblance of wealth or comfort. And he did it just for you or for me. That speaks of his humility. And of course, the humility of God is demonstrated to us in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says your attitude or your mind should be that of Christ Jesus.
Leviticus chapter 13. Now I want you to remember as we get through this, I'm going to read it quickly. Please bear with me as I read. You know I can't see. But remember from last week I said that the reasons behind all of these sacrifices, all of these instructions, is because God promised that they would not suffer from the diseases of the pagan peoples around them. And God is doing this for their own interest, for their own good. You know, when I grew up, if I hurt myself, baseball, I'd get hit by a pitch, my dad would yell, Ronnie, don't rub it. If I tore my knee up or something and it was bleeding, oh, you, you'll get over it. Just, just get up and run. It would have been easy in the ancient world, and that's what they did, just live with the diseases, live with the illnesses. And God basically saying, not my people. Now, here's some things that I want to remind you, things that most of you, if you've been around here any length of time at all, know. Leprosy, and that is the primary disease focused on in chapter 13. It also is a broader term than that, so it deals with other infectious diseases as well. But the NIV uses infectious diseases. The King James uses leprosy every single time. And this is about leprosy. The reason that matters to us is because leprosy is a type of sin. Leprosy starts out small, just a small, almost indistinguishable spot. It often attacks the appendages, the fingers, where the temperature, body temperature, is a little bit cooler, the toes, the same thing. It attacks nerve endings. At first you can feel it, but pretty soon the nerves are deadened and you can't feel it anymore. It would not be at all unusual for a leper in the ancient world to wake up one day and find some toes gone, having been gnawed off at night by rats. You can tell in advance how appetizing this study is going to be. But it starts out small and then it grows. And then pretty soon we're all covered up and Jesus is going to require that we say unclean, unclean as we're out among the people. Now, the reason it's a type of sin is because that's what sin does to you. It's what it does to me. We think it's no big deal. It's just something small and you can get away with it because nobody notices. But the longer you deal with the sin, the more it spreads and pretty soon everybody can tell there's something wrong with you. You know, in the ancient world, when Jesus approached those lepers, the ten lepers, and healed them, that was the time only one came back to thank him. You could smell a leper from a block away. And they hung out together. They couldn't hang around with normal people. And so the stench would be horrible. Well, that's what it's like with sin. People look at you and say, you know, something's not right. Oh, no, I'm fine. Well, no, I don't know. Something's, something's just not right. I'm praying for you. No, I'm closer to God than I've ever been. But there's this not real stench that becomes obvious to the people around you. And if you're dabbling in sin, if you think you can handle it, well, leprosy spreads. And it spreads and causes a lot of pain and really takes you out of the family of God and puts you out in a place where you're on your own. So this is a type of sin that God is dealing with and this is why he's going to be so specific and there's some really, really wonderful pictures here in the middle of all of this filth. Remember, most of this I'm going to read through very, very quickly. The the Lord said to Moses and Aaron... You know, one of the bad things about Leviticus, the two longest chapters in the book of Leviticus are this one and the next one. This one is the longest in terms of verses. The next chapter is the longest in terms of words. And that's because it's all about sin and then the remedy for sin. God's painting an important picture. The word unclean is used more than 50 times in these two chapters. God is trying to make a point. These chapters are about sin. Sin is a problem in our world. 
And that's why these chapters are so long. Again, I want to warn you, there's a lot of gross stuff here. Stuff that you'd rather not have to talk about, at least stuff I'd rather not have to talk about. So sort of press in with me, because the Lord has a message for us still. Verse 2, when anyone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin that may become an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to Aaron, the high priest, or to one of his sons who is a priest. Now, obviously, Aaron had a very difficult job. That's why I pray for Dr. Peter, Dr. Sheba, and the staff at Malta Medical. It is not a job where there's any glory. It's not a job where you think, oh, a doctor, it's one of those jobs. There's a a lot of prestige. No, there's just a lot of sickness. And that was the case here. Aaron and his sons were given this responsibility. It also appears that God was the very first in the world to think of separating people with contagious or infectious diseases from people who are well. That was his idea. Remember, he wanted to keep them away from the diseases, the illnesses of the pagans. They were going to be 40 years in the wilderness, and so they were going to need to take heed to these instructions. It says in verse 3, The priest is to examine the sore on his skin, And if the hair in the sore is turned white and the sore appears to be more than skin deep, it is an infectious skin disease. It is leprosy. When the priest examines him, he shall pronounce him ceremonially unclean. If the spot on his skin is white but does not appear to be more than skin deep and the hair in it is not turned white, the priest is to put the infected person in isolation for seven days. <clears throat> On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him, and if he sees that the sore is unchanged and is not spread in the skin, he's to keep him in isolation for another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him again, and if the sore has faded and is not spread in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It's only a rash. The man must wash his clothes, and he will be clean. Now, please notice here that the diagnosis is 100% on the priest. Here are the things that you'd have to do. And they literally would have to take their fingers and scratch into these things. And he made the diagnosis, and the diagnosis was based on one thing and one thing only, the Word of God. Leviticus chapter 13, Leviticus chapter 14, they were the ones who made the rules. Somebody can, oh, it's not that bad. You don't have to send me into isolation. No, it was all on the priest. Now, Jesus, of course, is our great high priest. Now, I say that because when we remember that leprosy is a type or a picture of sin, it means that there's only one person who gets to make a determination about what is or isn't sin. So many of us as Christians, we have a hard time with this, and I really don't understand it. One of the things that I'm able to do, if I sin, I can say, Lord, I did that. Knew I, sh- I knew I shouldn't have, but I did it anyway. But too often we Christians say, well, well, I just don't think there's anything wrong with that. Remember, Jesus is the one who makes the diagnosis. It's frustrating, I'm sure, for Dr. Peter, Dr. Sheba, when people go to them And they won't take their counsel. Here's what it is. Here's what you need to do. And they won't take their counsel. Well, how frustrating is it for Jesus? When Jesus says, here's your problem. I mean, he's got his fingers all in our stuff here. And he says, here's the diagnosis. It's sin. And yet we have the temerity to argue with him about it. Well, I don't see what the big deal is. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. We don't think that's a big deal. Jesus said, hey, I'm the doctor here. We've got churches now who are affirming sinful, wicked relationships. And they're doing it in the name of Christ. Lifestyles. Decisions about gender. And we have churches that are just making their own decisions about what is. And no, no, no. Only one person gets to decide what sin is and what sin isn't. And every one of us, we need to understand that Jesus makes the rules and we have to follow those rules if, in fact, we claim to be him. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. 
He doesn't ask us what we think about his decisions to call sin, sin. Let me also say this. It's our responsibility. Remember, we are a royal priesthood. And that's a wonderful thing, but there's some obligation or responsibility that goes along with that. We've got to be his diagnosticians when we run into people who are trying to justify their sin. I had a pastor not too long ago talk to me about cursing, using foul language. Well, you know, it's just a way to get real. It's a way to communicate with people. You know, we're in the business of communication. No, no, no. That's sin. You don't get a vote. God says it's sin. And for every one of us, we have to agree with him. And one of the things I always ask people, especially in counseling sessions, is how can you call yourself a Christian if you don't agree with your Christ? And that's exactly the picture that's being painted here. This was all on Aaron, and it's equally important, especially pastors here, those of you who may feel a calling to be a pastor. Aaron didn't get to diagnose and then say, well, you know, in my opinion, he had to look at the evidence based on the word that God gave him and declare clean or unclean. And all he had was the word. Exactly the same thing is true for you and for me. We have the word of God. And we need to understand that. God was so concerned that disease not spread that healthy people had to be protected from those who were sick. Again, it wasn't enough to say they were better or I think we're okay now. You simply look at the black and white facts and then you do as God told you to do. Those of us who are pastors and we're interpreting what God says. Flee from sexual immorality. Oh yeah, but God didn't mean... Well, we're not in a very, very safe place at all. Verse 7, But if the rash does spread in his skin, after he has shown himself to the priest to be pronounced clean, he must appear before the priest again. The priest is to examine him, and if the rash has spread in the skin, <clears throat> he shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infectious disease. Can I say one more time, leprosy is a type of of sin. When anyone has an infectious skin disease, when anyone has leprosy, he must be brought to the priest. <clears throat> the priest is to examine him, and if there's a white swelling in the skin that is turned the hair white, and if there's raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic skin disease, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He's not to put him in isolation because he is already unclean. Now, the infected person would no longer be under the supervision of the priest because the diagnosis has been made. You know what's interesting? When we tell somebody it's sin, and now you've got to make a decision about what you're going to do. You're going to do what God says, or you're going to do what you want to do. Very often they'll go just make the same decisions. They're not under anybody's supervision. They have to make the choice. This is a picture of that free will choice that we get to make. The only thing the priest could do was diagnose them as unclean and then the choice about how to live their lives was theirs. One of the things I don't want to spend too much time on, but I think it's important, is this demonstrates for all of us how important it is to be honest as we deal with the issue of sin in our life. Not, not in the lives of other people, but sin in our own lives. Paul says, examine your hearts daily to see whether or not you're in the faith. And I'm willing to bet that not very many Christians do that. You know, we'll throw out that flare prayer, Lord, if I've sinned, forgive me. But God wants us to, 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 to examine our heart. Let the Holy Spirit shine his light on that darkness. It could be just a little bit of darkness. But for the believer, a little bit of darkness is too much darkness. And God wants to shine the light on that darkness to help you, to bless you. Not to keep you from having fun, not to keep you just for himself. He wants to do it so that he can bless you. And we need to be honest dealing with sin. Jesus talked about the man 
who's always looking at the speck in somebody else's eye while he's got this big old log in his eye. We need to examine our own hearts and be honest about sin. We can't be relegated to the, well, if I sin kind of prayer. We've got to say, Lord, you know me in the deepest part. Search my heart, O God. We sing those songs. The psalmist writes about searching his heart. Surely, Lord, there's no unclean thing in me. Make sure there's no unclean thing in me. David could cry out, restore within me a right spirit, renew within me a right spirit and restore the joy of my salvation. We can't rationalize that what we're doing really isn't all that bad and God somehow understands we need to examine our hearts every day. Verse 12 says, If the disease breaks out all over his skin, and so far as the priest can see, it covers all of the skin of the infected person from head to foot, the priest is to examine him, and if the disease has covered his whole body, he shall pronounce that person clean. Since it is all turned out white, he is clean. Now that may sound counterintuitive to us, but the idea here is that the illness has run its course and it's now in the healing stage, so it's no longer contagious. But whenever raw flesh appears on him, he will be unclean. When the priest sees the raw flesh, he shall pronounce him unclean. The raw flesh is unclean clean, he has an infectious disease. Should the raw flesh change and turn white, he must go to the priest. The priest is to examine him, and if the sores have turned white, the priest shall pronounce the infected person clean, then he will be clean. And the idea there is that only God has the remedy for sin. You know, you may not think something you're doing is that bad, but if the black and white in the Bible says that you ought not to be doing that, you have to make the free will decision about who you're going to believe. The world around us, the, 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 the temptation of your flesh, or are you going to believe the word of God? Now, we're done with leprosy. I've never been so happy in my life to move on to boils. <clears throat> when someone has a boil on his skin and it heals... And in the place where the boil was, a white swelling or reddish-white spot appears. He must present himself to the priest. I love the detail here. And the reason I love the detail is because as you let the Word of God penetrate your heart, you're going to get a lot of detail. You know, we like just to brush over our sin. God says, no, 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 I got a lot of detail there. And he'll take you to that place where you can be free. The priest is to examine it, and if it appears to be more than skin deep, and the hair on, in it has turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy, an infectious skin disease, that is broken out where the boil was. But if, when the priest examines it, there's no white hair in it, and it is not more than skin deep, and is faded, then the priest is to put him in isolation for seven days, to, to see if it gets better. If it is spreading, in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is infectious. But if the spot is unchanged and is not spread, it's only a scar from the boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Verse 24, when someone has a burn on his skin and a reddish white or white spot appears in the raw flesh of the burn, the priest is to examine the spot, and if the hair in it has turned white, and it appears to be more than skin deep. It is an infectious disease. It is leprosy that is broken out in the burn. The priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infectious skin disease. But if the priest examines it, and there's no white hair in the spot, and if it's not more than skin deep, and is faded, then the priest is to put him in isolation for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him, and if it is spreading in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infectious skin disease. If, however, the spot is unchanged and is not spread in the skin, but is faded, it is a swelling from the burn, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. It's only a scar from the burn. Again, in, as in all the other cases, it is the priest who's doing the examination and he's making the decisions 
or the diagnosis based solely on the Word of God. And that's all to ensure that there's nothing else going on. Verse 29 is kind of funny. If you have a King James, you'll get this. It says, and I'm going to read the King James for the first part. If a man or woman has a sore on the head or in the beard. Now, if a woman has a beard, just separate her for seven days and see what happens. But it really is. It says in the NIV, on the chin. But the idea is it's in the beard. It's, it's, you can't get to it cleanly. The priest is to examine the sore, and if it appears to be more than skin deep, and the hair in it is yellow and thin, the priest shall pronounce that person unclean. It is an itch. Now, this isn't an ordinary itch. I'll talk about this in a moment. It is an infectious disease of the head or chin. Now, this itch describes, in Hebrew, an itching that's so intense that it drives you mad. It's just one of those things. That's what this is all about. You can't stop scratching. It's when I was thinking as I was reading, I hope you've all not eaten when you came here or aren't waiting to eat when you go home. Um, I think we've all had times. My grandma used to bathe me in calamine lotion. Measles, whatever it was, chicken pox, bathe me in calamine lotion. Grandma, I'm itching. Don't scratch it. Don't scratch it. You couldn't help but to scratch it. That's the kind of itching that's in view here. Verse 31 says, But if when the priest examines this kind of sore, it does not seem to be more than skin deep, and there's no black hair in it, then the priest is to put the infected person in isolation for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine the sore, and if the itch has not spread, and there's no yellow hair in it, and it does not appear to be more than skin deep, he must be shaved except for the diseased area, and the priest is to keep him in isolation another seven days. And they're being very careful with this because, again, they don't want the diseases to spread among the people. They couldn't go get calamine lotion. There wasn't medication. Uh, there weren't over-the-counter drugs. So they just had to depend on what God's Word said. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine the itch, and if it is not spread in the skin and appears to be no more than skin deep, the priest shall pronounce him clean. He must wash his clothes and he will be clean. But if the itch does spread in the skin after he's pronounced clean, the priest is to examine him. And if the itch is spread in the skin, the priest does not need to look for yellow hair. The person is unclean. In other words, this is an obvious reoccurrence and needs to be rendered as unclean. If, however, in his judgment it is unchanged, and black hair is grown in it, the itch is healed, he's clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. The priest, again, had the sole authority to pronounce someone clean, go on with your life, or no, no, you still have to be in this place where you're protected and we're protecting other people from you. The same principle is true when it comes to your sin and mine. You know, we live in a world and I really wasn't aware of this because I wasn't raised in a religious house. I didn't go to church. But when 9-11 happened and there were Catholic priests pronouncing absolution for all of the victims, nobody has that authority. Only God can forgive sins. And Aaron in his role as high priest is a model of that. He's the only one who could pronounce someone clean. The other thing for you and for me, we carry such good news. I tell you that all the time. But our good news, regardless of who you're speaking to, is that we can pronounce people clean. We can pronounce forgiveness of sins. All they have to do is believe and receive, repent of their sins. That's an indication that they really believe. But the idea here is that we can say, now you're clean. You can have a brand new start in life. And I can promise you, there's nobody that you know, uh, a saved or unsaved, but especially the unsaved, who doesn't need a new start in life. They may pretend everything's okay. I'm fine. I'm happy. 
but they need a new beginning in life. And you and I, we can make that pronunciation. And sometimes when people don't want to hear about your Jesus, you can close the conversation. Some people are saying, well, look, I can promise you the forgiveness of everything that you've done. I can promise you that God will take you into heaven. And if you ever want to talk, and I usually say it this way, if you ever really want to talk about important stuff, I'll be here for you. And you and I, we can pronounce people clean. Now, we have no authority to forgive their sins, but based on the word that God has given us, we can pronounce people clean. Verse 38, when a man or woman has white spots on the skin, the priest is to examine them. And if the spots are dull white, and sounds like he's talking about freckles here, it is a harmless rash that is broken out on the skin that person is cleaning. Now, what happens next may offend some in here. Verse 40. <clears throat> when a man has lost his hair and is bald, he is clean. If he has lost his hair from the front of his scalp and has a bald forehead, receding hairlines. Now, you guys know I can't see, but I can say with pretty much certainty that there's some significant receding hairlines out there. <laughs> He's clean. In other words, you're not bald because you sinned. But if he has a reddish white sore in his bald head or forehead, it is leprosy, an infectious disease, breaking out on his head or forehead. The priest is to examine him, and if the swollen, swollen sore on his head or forehead is reddish white, like an infectious disease, the man is diseased and is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him unclean because of the sore on his head. Now, you might wonder why this is in there about baldness. We, we don't have any questions about that because it's so common. But evidently, in the ancient world, um, baldness was believed to be a contagious disease. When, Ken, I don't think you'll mind this, will you? Many, many years ago, Nia was small. And she was talking to May, and they were talking about growing up, getting married. And May made, asked the question to Nia. She said, honey, when you get married, do you want a man just like your daddy? And Nia got her face, she has a way of scrunching up her face. Scrunch her face, she said, well, I want one with hair. <laughs> Those of you who are bald, it's okay. I pronounce you all clean. <laughs> the person with such an infectious disease, again leprosy, must wear torn clothes. Now, I know this has been boring, but don't tune me out because this gets pretty important in practical ways for us here. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes. Let his hair be kept unkempt. Cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. We've talked about that in the New Testament a lot of times. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Now, this doesn't mean that they had to live in isolation from other human beings. It's why leper colonies uh, existed. It's why lepers hang out together because there was no danger of spreading the disease because everybody had it. It just meant that they couldn't be around ordinary people. This idea of yelling out unclean, imagine if God would require that of us. Maybe over the weekend you had what you thought was fun and did some really dumb things because you drank a little bit too much or party a little bit too much. Imagine if on Monday you had to go to work yelling, unclean, unclean, and people would back away from you. Well, that's exactly what it was like. And as I told you earlier, the, the stench of leprosy could be smelled a block away. And I repeat that because I, I just think of Jesus encountering 10 lepers. And Jesus didn't hold his nose. Jesus didn't say, you guys are really gross. You're disgusting. Jesus touched them. Now, we have a tendency to think that some sins are really gross. 
And we don't want anything to do with people who have those kind of sins in their lives. That's to misrepresent Jesus. Those are the people that are the object of our ministries. Those are the people that we ought to be touching. As all of you know, I'm a toucher. People want to shake my hand and I say, look, I'll shake your hand, but I'm a hugger. Is that okay? And, and if they say no, I won't do it. But, but most people say, oh yeah, that's fine. I want people to know that God loves them. I want them to experience the physical touch. I remember talking to Sheba one time and she said, Pastor, it's so easy to share the gospel with people at Malta. People get saved so easily. I thought maybe I'm doing it wrong. But you see, the idea is the physical touch along with the power of God's Spirit and the wonder of the message that we carry is important. But we can't be off-put by people's lifestyles. Now, we, we don't like their lifestyle, but we've somehow got to communicate to them that God loves them. And this is a lifestyle that's going to hurt them. It's a lifestyle that's going to separate them from God. And if we don't talk to them because we just don't like those people, we're the ones who are misrepresenting the Lord more than they are because we, of course, claim to belong to the Lord. At Malta Medical, when they take time with people and touch them, we have a very, very large number of gay and transgender people coming to Malta Medical. Every one of them hears about Jesus. Every one of them is treated with dignity and respect. Every one of them is told that what they're doing is wrong, but God loves you. And because I love you, I'm telling you the truth. But we still need to treat them with dignity and respect. We can't sort of scrunch up our nose and turn away and just, well, you know, those people. That's one of the problems that we have. Why we're so often considered as being narrow-minded or bigoted or hateful. Because we'd just rather not be nice to people that disgust us. What did the Apostle John say? How can you say that you love God if you don't love people? The people for whom he died. And our act of love is to give them the message. But we do it with love. And we do it with patience. And we do it with kindness. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. That's how important it is for us. We can tell somebody directly that what they're doing is wrong and God hates it, but he loves you. And the idea in this world that the only way we can love people is to accept them and what they're doing the way they are, that's not loving at all. We need to be bold in sharing that with people. Jesus touched them. He ate with them. Now, he never did what they did, but he was there for them. And his message to them was always the same. Now, go and sin no more. Jewish custom, this will sound familiar for those of us who lived through the pandemic, Jewish custom required that they stay six feet away from uninfected people. The woman with the issue of blood she dared to touch his robe, the hem of his robe. And she was healed. The lepers that Jesus touched, that would have absolutely disgusted the religious leaders of Jesus' day. But he healed them. And it's interesting to me that when he healed them, he knew that nine of them weren't going to be grateful at all. They weren't going to come back. We would say that they're not saved. Their disease got better for a moment. But when the one came back and thanked the Lord, Jesus said, where are the other nine? I don't know, but I'm here because I'm so grateful. And the gospel says that he was the one who was made whole. In other words, well. We're God's ambassadors in this world. And that means because we're doctors of a sort, we have the word of God. We can diagnose people, not judge their hearts, but we can diagnose their lives. We've got to be like Jesus. 
rather than avoid them, rather than making them a political issue, we need to remember that those are people that have broken God's heart because he loves them so much. And we've got to communicate that to them as well. This is also significant. If any clothing is contaminated with mildew, any woolen or linen clothing, any woven or knitted material of linen or wool, any leather or anything made of leather, and if the contamination in the clothing or leather or woven or knitted material or any leather article is greenish or reddish, it is a spreading mildew and must be shown to the priest. The priest is to examine the mildew and isolate the affected article, not the person, isolate the infected article for seven days. On the seventh day is to examine it, and if the mildew is spread in the clothing, or the woven, or the knitted material, or the leather, whatever is used, it is a destructive mildew. The article is unclean. Look at verse 52. He must burn it, burn up the clothing, or the woven or knitted material, of wool or linen or any leather article that has the contamination in it because the mildew is destructive, the article must be burned up. All of this to ensure that disease hasn't spread. Now, I, I want you to pay attention just for another five minutes. The reason this matters is because we're all clothed. You know, the Apostle Paul writes about our clothing. You are clothed in Jesus Christ. In other words, take off or put off the old clothing, the clothing of carnality, the clothing of this world, and put on the new clothing given to Christ. We've got to isolate ourselves from the contaminated articles of this world. We've got to do that. We've got to do it because we understand it's good for us. We understand that it's necessary. Too often as Christians, we try to see how much we can get away with and still be saved. Well, I don't see why this is bad. Uh, I don't think if I do this, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm not saved. And instead, what we ought to be doing is seeing how close to Jesus we could get. And when we don't burn up, put off, destroy the old junk in our lives then that contamination is still there and it's all around you. Now, again, I can't go off here because of time, but whether it's social media, whether it's the, the kind of movies you watch or the television shows that you watch, the stuff that you look at, maybe the behavior, you drink or you're doing drugs, you just don't think it's that big a deal, you're, you're being contaminated. The world that we live in is a world that Isaiah prophesied about, a world that calls evil good and good evil. That's contaminating each and every one of us. And we're being infected by those things, by those ideas. And I've tried to tell our church many, many times that the only insulation from the world and the world's ability to brainwash, to persuade you, is the Word of God. Romans chapter 12, Paul talks about being renewed at thinking. How do we do that? In the Word. In the Word, if you're not serious about your Bible, then the onslaught of propaganda in this world is going to destroy you. The prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, he wanted to live a worldly life. The father let him exercise his free will. And then when he found himself in the pigsty, longing for food, even the scraps that the servants in his father's house ate, I love the King James, it says, when he came to his own mind. A lot of us, were not controlled by our own mind. We're controlled by social media. We're controlled by social attitudes. We're controlled by the people that we hang around with. And we've got to separate ourselves. It doesn't mean we're not in this world. We're in the world, and we're in the world with the message of salvation. But the reality is that we've got to separate our lives. Moms and dads, what's going on behind closed doors and in your home is affecting and influencing your children. 
My dad said it a hundred times in my life. Ronnie, do as I say, not as I do. Well, that doesn't work. And if you're not isolating yourself from the things that can contaminate you, burning them up, dying daily, the Apostle Paul says we're to make no provision for the flesh. This may seem extreme to some of you. Well, well you've you got to just get away from it. Yeah, you do. Because it wants to destroy you. And remember, I said at the very beginning tonight, leprosy starts small. Almost imperceptible. And then by the time it starts to spread, there's nothing you can do about it. Now Jesus will touch you and he'll heal you. But you've got to be in a place where you can approach him. But if when the priest examines it, the mildew is not spread in the clothing or the woven or knitted a leather, he shall order that the con contaminated article be washed. Then he is to isolate it for another seven days. After the affected article has been washed, the priest is to examine it. And if the mildew has not changed its appearance, even though it is not spread, it is unclean. Burn it with fire. Whether the mildew has affected one side or the other, if when the priest examines it, the mildew has faded after the article has been washed, he is to tear the contaminated part out of the clothing or the leather or the woven or knitted materials. But if it reappears in the clothing, now remember, they couldn't just go to Walmart and buy clothes. I can't believe, I, did I say that? Do we still buy clothes at Walmart? <laughs> or in the woven knitted material, or in the leather article, it is spreading and whatever the mildew, whatever is the mildew, must be burned with fire. The clothing of the woven or knitted material or any leather article that has been washed and is rid of the mildew must be washed again and it will be clean. Um, some clothing could be saved, obviously. And then it closes the chapter. These are the regulations. Please note they don't change. It doesn't say these are the temporary regulations. These are the once forever regulations concerning contamination by mildew and wool or linen clothing, woven or knitted material, or any leather article for pronouncing them clean or unclean. I hope you all feel a little bit cleaner now. And as you read ahead chapter 14 and 15 next week, let me just say, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't come. <laughs> Father, we thank you for helping me get through this. I pray, Lord, there was something in it for everybody here tonight.